This is Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'm going to discuss the relationship between vitamin D and autoimmune conditions, and I'll discuss the importance of getting the 25-hydroxy vitamin D test. I'll also go over some actual vitamin D reports to make sure you understand the difference between the lab and optimal reference ranges, when it's necessary to supplement with vitamin D, and how much vitamin D I would recommend based on the results. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand the test results so that they can find or remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. I need to let you know that this video is not meant to be used as medical advice or as a recommended treatment protocol, and it isn't a replacement for consulting with a competent healthcare practitioner. I'd like to start off by discussing some vitamin D basics. Many people are aware of the importance of healthy vitamin D levels with regards to bone health, but vitamin D has many other important functions. In fact, just about every tissue and cell in your body has vitamin D receptors. Unfortunately, many people are deficient in vitamin D. Others have their vitamin D levels fall within the lab reference range, but while most of the research still suggests that the level should be above 30 nanograms per milliliter, many sources suggest for these levels to be 50 nanograms per milliliter or greater, including the vitamin D council. Vitamin D increases the intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus, which in turn promotes bone mineralization and remodeling, and it is also involved in regulating serum calcium and phosphorus levels. This is the main reason why most medical doctors test for vitamin D, as they are concerned about low levels affecting bone mineral density. However, vitamin D also plays a big role in immunity, which of course is important for those with autoimmune conditions. When you look at the lab reference ranges for vitamin D, the lower end of these ranges relates to bone health. In other words, if the levels get below this range, then there is a concern that the bone mineral density will decrease. Most labs have a reference range between 30 and 100 nanograms per milliliter for 25-hydroxy vitamin D. This will vary depending on the lab, as some labs will have the lower value as 20 nanograms per milliliter, while others will have the higher value at 80 nanograms per milliliter. But with regards to immune system health, there is more and more evidence that the optimal range probably should be somewhere between 50 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. It's worth mentioning that some labs use nanomoles per liter as the units for 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and 50 nanograms per milliliter is equivalent to 125 nanomoles per liter. Let's talk about vitamin D and autoimmunity, as there are numerous studies which show that vitamin D plays an important role in modulating the immune system and inflammation. It appears to do this by decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines and is also associated with an increased number of regulatory T cells which help to suppress autoimmunity. Many studies show a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and autoimmunity. A few studies have shown that low levels of vitamin D are associated with the presence of antithyroid antibodies and abnormal thyroid function. Both people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Graves' disease commonly have low levels of vitamin D. The authors of a comprehensive review suggest that the levels of serum vitamin D affects the risk of developing multiple sclerosis and also modifies disease activity in MS patients. Another study showed that vitamin D plays an important role in the pathogenesis and progression of systemic lupus erythematosus. And another study showed that a vitamin D deficiency is more common in those with alopecia areata and that supplementing with vitamin D might reduce the severity of the disease and possibly induce remission. In my practice, it is very common for my autoimmune patients to have a vitamin D deficiency. I can't say that correcting this, this deficiency alone is usually sufficient to get the person into a state of remission, although since vitamin D is important for optimal immune system health, I think it's safe to say that it will be very challenging to regain one's health if such a deficiency isn't corrected. So why are many people deficient in vitamin D? Let's discuss some of the different reasons. First of all, most people don't get enough sunlight exposure. Sunlight is required for ultraviolet B or UVB light induced vitamin D production in the skin. I admit that I'm guilty of not getting enough exposure to sunlight, as while I'd like to say that I take a 30 minute walk in the sun every day, this usually isn't the case. And keep in mind that the amount of skin that is exposed to the sun plays a big factor. For example, if someone takes a walk in the sun fully clothed, then they will produce much less vitamin D when compared to someone who is sunbathing. 
And then there's latitude. Those who live in northern latitudes have a decreased exposure to sunlight during the winter and thus are more likely to be deficient in vitamin D. VDR polymorphism. Well, polymorphism is a genetic variation. So vitamin D binds to the vitamin D receptor, which in turn is encoded by the VDR gene. And again, many people have genetic polymorphisms of the VDR gene, which can increase one's risk of developing a vitamin D deficiency. And the research shows an association between VDR polymorphisms and autoimmunity. Skin pigmentation. So those with dark colored skin absorb more UBV light in the melanin of their skin. And as a result, they require more sun exposure to produce the same amount of vitamin D. Air pollution can block the absorption of UBV light. And this, of course, is a factor wherever you live. But if you live in a larger city, then chances are you are dealing with a greater amount of air pollution. Aging affects vitamin D metabolism. As the older you get, the less vitamin D is produced by the skin. Frequent sunscreen use. So many people apply sunscreen whenever they go out in the sun. And since sunscreen blocks the absorption of vitamin D, using it frequently can lead to vitamin D deficiency. This isn't meant to suggest that you should never use sunscreen, but I would try to get at least 20 to 30 minutes of sun exposure daily without the use of sunscreen. And then there's deficiency in one of the nutritional cofactors. Vitamin D works together with numerous cofactors, including magnesium, vitamin K2, zinc, boron, and vitamin A. Some healthcare practitioners will test 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And when you consider that this is the active form of vitamin D, this might make sense. However, it's important to understand that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is regulated by parathyroid hormone. And when someone has a vitamin D deficiency, this results in a compensatory increase in the parathyroid hormone levels, and this in turn will increase 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And so 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is usually normal or elevated, even in the presence of a vitamin D deficiency. According to the research, there are a few other clinical advantages of testing 25 hydroxy vitamin D over 125 dihydroxy vitamin D as 25 hydroxy vitamin D has the highest concentration of all vitamin D metabolites and its levels remain stable for almost two weeks. Overall, they conclude that 25 hydroxy vitamin D is the best indicator of vitamin D status among those who do not have kidney disease. I'm not done with the presentation yet. But I want to quickly ask you what other blood test videos do you want to see besides vitamin D? Please feel free to let me know in the comments below. So how do you increase vitamin D levels? One way is to get more sunlight exposure. Ideally, this is the best way to increase vitamin D levels as we need to keep in mind that in the past, people didn't take vitamin D3 supplements as they do today. However, times have changed as many people don't get regular sun exposure and many who do are fully clothed. In addition, air pollution is a big issue. As I mentioned earlier, how this can block the absorption of UVB light, which can lead to a vitamin D deficiency. I also mentioned the frequent use of sunscreen, which also wasn't used in the past. You could try eating food sources of vitamin D. Uh, some of the main dietary sources of vitamin D include fish, especially salmon and sardines, as well as eggs and dairy products. Just keep in mind that eating food sources of vitamin D alone probably won't maintain healthy levels, and it almost definitely won't be enough to correct the deficiency. It's also worth mentioning that some people with autoimmune conditions choose to avoid certain food sources of vitamin D, especially dairy, and many will also avoid eggs. The third way to increase your vitamin D levels is by supplementing with vitamin D. Many people will need to supplement with vitamin D3 to correct the deficiency. Some people also need to supplement with vitamin D3 on an ongoing basis in order to maintain levels greater than 50 nanograms per milliliter, while others will be able to maintain healthy vitamin D levels through sun, sunlight exposure and perhaps eating food sources of vitamin D on a frequent basis. When supplementing with vitamin D3, it's also a good idea to supplement with vitamin K2, as this vitamin is necessary to help escort calcium into the bones. If vitamin K2 is low, then some of the calcium will end up in the soft tissues of the body, such as the arteries. You might wonder how much vitamin D you should take if you have a deficiency, and this depends on how deficient the person is. If someone has a severe vitamin D deficiency, they might need to take 10,000 IUs per day for a vitamin D3 for a few months, while those with a mild to moderate vitamin D deficiency might need to take anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 IUs per day. Some are concerned about vitamin D toxicity, which can be a concern if you take very high doses for a prolonged period of time. 
Supplemental vitamin D comes in two primary forms. When someone purchases vitamin D in a health food store, they are usually getting cholecalciferol, which is also known as vitamin D3. On the other hand, when a medical doctor writes a prescription, it is for ergocalciferol, which is known as vitamin D2. Even though some sources claim that these two are equivalent, vitamin D3 has been proven to be the more potent form of vitamin D in all primate species, including humans. One study showed that vitamin D2 was absorbed just as well as vitamin D3, yet blood levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D started dropping rapidly after three days among those given vitamin D2, whereas those on vitamin D3 sustained higher levels for two weeks before dropping gradually. And so the effects of vitamin D3 last much longer than vitamin D2. Let's take a quick look at a few vitamin D reports. In this report, the person clearly has a vitamin D deficiency as they have a vitamin D level of 18 nanograms per milliliter. You can see that this lab considers anything less than 20 to be a deficiency, between 20 and 29 to be insufficient, and anything 30 or greater to be optimal. But as I mentioned earlier, you want the levels to be greater than 50 nanograms per milliliter for optimal immune system health. In this situation, I probably would have the person take 10,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3 for two months or so, and then they could either retest at that point, or they could drop down to 5,000 IUs per day for a few additional months before retesting. Here we see that this person has a vitamin D of 48.9, which is slightly lower than we'd like to see. If this person wasn't taking any vitamin D, I'd have her supplement with 1,000 to 2,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3 and retest after a few months. If she was already supplementing with vitamin D3, I would most likely have her increase it by 1 or 2,000 IUs per day. Here we see a lab that uses 20 nanograms per milliliter as a lower end of their reference range. And here it says that values greater than or equal to 20 are adequate for most patients, although some high-risk patients may require 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels greater than 30. But many medical doctors only look at the lab reference range and would consider this to be normal since the lab didn't red flag the patient as being deficient. Since we're aiming to get the levels to at least 50 nanograms per milliliter, I probably would have this person supplement with 5,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3 for a few months and then retest. I should mention that in all of these cases, I would also recommend for the person to try to get more sunlight exposure whenever possible. In this report, we see a vitamin D level on the high side at 92.5 nanograms per milliliter. And while there are some practitioners who recommend for the patient's vitamin D levels to be greater than 80 nanograms per milliliter, as of this recording, I can't say that I recommend for the levels to be this high. And so assuming this person was supplementing with vitamin D3, I probably would have them cut back by at least 1,000 to 2,000 IUs per day. And some might wonder why I wouldn't just have the person stop supplementing with vitamin D in this situation. And while this is an option to consider, my concern is that they will stop taking it completely and will then become deficient. If you were to have levels on the high end and stop taking it, I would recommend retesting in a month or so to make sure the numbers don't drop down too low, which I've seen happen many times. But it really depends on the person as, for example, let's say this person was taking 10,000 IUs per day, then in this situation, I might have the person drop down to 5,000 IUs per day and then retest. So again, it really does depend on the situation and we take each case on an individual basis. In this report, we see a lab that used the units nanomoles per liter and you can see that they consider 76 to 250 nanomoles per liter to be sufficient. However, earlier I mentioned that 50 nanograms per milliliter is equivalent to 125 nanomoles per liter. And in this example, you can see that the value is 113 nanomoles per liter, which is a little lower than optimal. And so I would have the person take at least 1,000 IUs to 2,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3. And just a reminder that when supplementing with vitamin D3, you also want to take vitamin K2. And in the description below, I'll include an example of a supplement that has vitamin D3 with K2, although you, of course, can use a different brand or you could take vitamin D and vitamin K2 as separate supplements. Now that you've seen a few examples of vitamin D reports, I want to briefly discuss some things you need to know about dosing with vitamin D3. As you already know, many people need to supplement with vitamin D3 to achieve optimal levels. You might want to know if it's possible to maintain healthy vitamin D levels without supplementation. And some people who get regular sun exposure don't need to supplement with vitamin D, but it does depend on the person as well as the environment they live in. 
In most cases, supplements with vitamin D3 will be needed to correct the deficiency, and the amount of vitamin D3 needed depends on how severe the deficiency is, although there can be other factors as well. For example, if someone has a genetic variation or genetic polymorphism of the vitamin D receptor, then they might need to take higher doses of vitamin D3 even if they don't have a deficiency. Once someone has achieved optimal levels of vitamin D, the only way to know if they will need to take a maintenance dosage of vitamin D is through follow-up testing, and of course this will also determine how much they need to take if they do need to continue supplementing with it. For example, I take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3 on a daily basis, and this keeps my levels in the upper 50s and lower 60s, which I know because I test my vitamin D levels at least once per year. On the other hand, some people might be able to maintain healthy levels by taking only 1,000 to 2,000 IUs of vitamin D3 per day, while others might not need to supplement at all with vitamin D to maintain healthy levels. Once again, the only way to know this is through follow-up testing. I also need to mention that while I realize that many people will take vitamin D on their own, it really is a good idea to be under the guidance of a healthcare practitioner. I'd love to hear what your experience has been with vitamin D, and so please post a comment below, or if you have any questions related to vitamin D, let me know. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe right now while it's on your mind, and don't forget to click on the notification bell so you'll be sure to get notified whenever I release a new video.